colleagues. Uh, I'm really glad I have the possibility to present my work here. Uh, my topic is uh, concerning the study of uh, affordances as a way uh, of understanding purpose of archaeological sites in the landscape. Uh, actually, the term affordance, affordance uh, was set up in the literature by J.J. Uh, Gibson in 1980s. And uh, I feel this very strong concept because it says that the landscape may be divided into, into some latent uh, functional potentials, which are might uh, be uh, intentionally, intentionally used by, he, he uh, tested it as well on animals, by how uh, he talked about animals, but especially it can be used by the humans. And uh, only the interaction reveals the potential and it uh, might be revealed or might not. And this is something what is very important for archaeology because then we can uh, say that if we track down the potential and then track down the uh, properties of specific sites, we can uh, see the intention in the behavior of the past populations. Uh, <clears throat> For my work, I chosen the topic of elite seeds in uh, medieval and post-medieval times. Uh, and it was especially because uh, if we wanted to track down some potentials, we need to know uh, what uh, might be sought by the builders of the seeds. So the definition of the seed is pretty important. Uh, and I perceive it as uh, primarily a residential area, with uh, some uh, specific usage for daily operations, for defense and security, for economic activities, for administrative and organizational purposes, uh, to exercise social representation and symbolism, and as well to express political power. Uh, and those I further refer as uh, purpose categories. Uh, what can be said as well is that degree of social complexity and the specialization of the elite influence the shape of those sides in the landscape and th their forms as well and their positions in the landscape. Uh, and of course, there are many layers of this phenomena, both social, structural one, uh, even based, which means some individual uh, decisions and expressive, which may be tracked down as cultural uh, habits. Uh, let's speak about specialization, what it means. It means that there are some uh, ways uh, in which the seeds were uh, specifically set up to meet with some requirements for production, for defense, for social uh, interaction, for organizational purposes, for communication uh, with other sites, uh, and as well for visual control over the landscape. Uh, and those uh, functional potentials might be then derived from some properties of the landscape like visibility, accessibility, and so on. Uh, for my study, I uh, used a sample of uh, 13, uh, 1,300 uh, sites uh, in Bohemia, uh, which are dated up from 13th to 17th century. And as well, as a background data, I used a random reference sample with something like 13,000 records. Uh, <clears throat> and then it, my analysis is based in the comparison of both the sam sample, uh, the real data and the sample data, and as well of some models which, I, which will be shown later. Uh, <clears throat> actually, this is the map of the uh, 5,000 known seeds in Bohemia. However, only, as I said, only 13,000 might, might be, uh, 1,300 of them might be uh, analyzed because of many reasons, of course, like state of the uh, preservation and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but as you can see, the distribution uh, is uneven. However, actually it's not so much true because if you see the red underlying uh, layer, that is uh, a spread of the medieval settlement. 
and actually the seeds are almost everywhere where the settlement was. So the holes in the in the data are not the structure in the uh, distribution of seeds, but it's a, it's a the, uh, structure of distribution of the settlement itself. Uh, <clears throat> what can be uh, said uh, is that the sample was uh, representative because, as you can see, uh, if you compare the uh, percentage of, or the chronological setting of the used sample and all the data which may be dated, the uh, charts are almost the same. Uh, there are some, some uh, trends in the data, of course, in chronological terms, and th those are not important for my, for my point today, so I will skip the, um, skip the graph now. Uh, but what is more important is that uh, I, as best background, used as well uh, high-resolution DIM, which it was lidar based. Originally, it was uh, it was uh, one point per meter, I think. However, uh, I uh, uh, lowered the scale to eight meters uh, cell size because uh, the processing time would be too too big. <clears throat> uh, then every side was. Uh, uh, delimited as polygon, as polygonal feature, and as well the internal internal um, uh, structuring was sought to be able to determine the complexity of the site and so on. Uh, as you can see, there were many sources, of course, not only the LIDAR was used to, to derive the, the shape of the site, but as well the original planning documentation. However, often it, sh it has shown that the LIDAR is much more precise than the original documentation. Uh, and then, uh, to how to derive those affordances, as I have been speaking about first. Uh, of course, <clears throat> There are many uh, very simple uh, properties of the landscape which may be used, like altitude or eleva uh, elevation uh, slope and so on, as we, as we all know. But I think that uh, we need to use much more complex data, uh, to un to which can be directly tracked down in the landscape by, by people uh, when they are com coming to the landscape and what they see. So, first of all, I used the uh, classification model which I created for all the country, uh, and it was uh, it used uh, TPI uh, uh, topography position index, but a bit enhanced because uh, I seen some classes missing in the in the topographic position index, especially those edges and ridges, which uh, are very uh, important for setting up uh, setting up uh, elite seeds, as well the. Uh, hydrological model was was created for uh, for the uh, for the territory. Uh, it uh, I have derived some important water courses and as well flooding areas. Uh, and as you can see, what is important? Uh, of course, this is not the original model. This is the original. Uh, but then I averaged the data to track down some trends. So that is what we may somehow perceive the affordance if there is a probability of the water being in the landscape or not. Uh, same might be done with visibility. Uh, <clears throat> again, the best will be to use total visibility. In that case, I didn't do that because it was impossible. Uh, but I used those 13,000 random points to derive visibility from each one and then uh, used kernel, uh, not kernel density, but averaging to, to make some background data. And as you can see, uh, the important, important structures are coming out after the, uh, comparing real data uh, in a relation to the background data. So, because there is a big difference if you perceive visual visibility in the hilly area or in the flatland. And the uh, re relation of those, of those, uh, of those uh, properties is much more uh, important for tracking down the, in, the intention of the, of the behavior. Again, <clears throat> another layer might be the travel network uh, or route network. Uh, I use the uh, algorithms explained by Philip Fergagen and the others uh, to create natural, natural, natural route network, uh, so which gives you again some uh, general uh, 
affordance of the landscape towards accessibility. And as well, I said it very, very important is some, some connection to, to the settlement network. So I use some uh, database called CZ Retro, uh, which is, uh, which covers the development of, of, uh, settlement from medieval times, uh, which may be used as a, as a background for resettlement. And all those things combined, of course, give us tremendous amount of data, uh, which might or might be not understandable. And how to approach them? Of course, we may use some traditional statistical approaches. But I feel that many times there are a lot of problems with uh, missing values, with different kinds of, of uh, attributes and so on. Uh, of course, those graphs are very important and show many trends. E even uh, only the, the position in terrain uh, is shown to be very chronologically uh, uh, sensitive. So there is a direct move from the uh, very uh, hit, um, prominent position downhill during the chronology, uh, in chronological times. However, what I done was uh, creating some group of attributes for every uh, functional potential described before to uh, and uh, cr uh, track down some relation between the randomized data and the real data and create it a coefficient for each of the purpose of, of that uh, potential <laughs> and then combine them by hypothetically, of course, that there is this is pure hypothesis how they might be combined uh, to fit to the purposes which were being set up uh, during the uh, during the uh, definition of the of the seed. And what I get is coefficient for each of that of, for that purpose uh, category. Uh, which may be related to chronology, and you, you, you can see some direct uh, direct uh, trends in the data, like B is a defense, defensive potential, which just lowers during the time. And you can, you can see there are some really big, uh, big changes in, in very short time periods. Uh, as well, you can uh, map them spatially to track down some, some uh, uh, state of the uh, settlement in specific uh, specific uh, time layer, time layer, and of course you may do any other analysis with that, like network analysis. Uh, this is this network analysis uses the similarity based on the uh, share difference between coefficients I derivated, and as you can see clearly, there is again some chronological uh, chronological trend in the in the graph because the, the uh, colors marks the chronological uh, aspect. And of course, it might be as well used to derive some typological, uh, typological uh, groups for the seeds, uh, where it is possible to test how similar or different are those typological groups in terms of the functional potentials or uh, pur purpose uh, categories de defined. To summarize, uh, I think that the model of or uh, theory of affordances is very promising uh, way how to per perceive landscape in studying archaeological data, because it gives you the uh, impression of intentionality in the past behavior, and that uh, in that terms, GIS models may be used as a part of the finding context, in fact. Uh, often, especially for medieval uh, or historical archaeology, it is, it, is, it is very common to use historical models to create, uh, to, to, um, create some basic corpus. But, but I think the best way for archaeology is to create its own models based on its own hypothesis. And then, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, later stages to test them against historical uh, models. And what can be summarized, of course, I didn't go into the, into the detail about the result, real results of my work, but uh, what can be said is how I'm impressed how it is really possible to use elite structures 
to study some more uh, wider uh, so social uh, social uh, chronologic, chronological changes in the in the uh, settlement. So thank you for attention.